Okay, we've got four brief reflections on David, starting with uh, Ken Miller. So, um, I first met David, I think, a couple of months into his first year as a grad student at Caltech, which must have been the fall of 89. Um, I was up at, uh, in San Francisco. I just finished my PhD uh, and was doing a postdoc year. And um, I had, had published my thesis work on uh, a model of the development of uh, a structure in visual cortex known as ocular dominance columns. And um, there had been another prominent model published uh, sort of in parallel, although published much earlier, uh, by Ralph Linsker on the development of uh, orientation selectivity, a different structure in, in V1. And that, that paper was, um, it was very important and, and interesting and introduced really important new ideas, but it was also murky because it, it, there were many things going on and it didn't really tease out what was, what was key to the results. So I, uh, I was invited down to Caltech to give a talk that fall, and um, there was an announcement that at noon uh, there was going to be a seminar on someone talking about uh, Linsker's model. And I uh, asked my host, uh, a postdoc, uh, if, this, if I should go to this. And he said, oh, no, no, that's just a first year student talking. It's nothing you don't know. Um, so I didn't go. Um, <laughs> um, but fortunately, that uh, first year student, this uh, tall, thin, uh, uh, very polite British lad came up to me at some point, uh, maybe after my talk, and handed me his paper and said, uh, you know, Dr. Miller, would you please look at my paper? I said, you know, sure, I'd like to. So my day went on, and I went home, or went, not went home, but went to my uh, room that night and took out this paper and started reading it. And I went, oh my god, you know, why didn't I think of this? This is fantastic. Um, and David had uh, essentially completely analyzed the, uh, the structure of the equations that uh, Linsker had used and proposed from that structure some reasons as to why he got the behavior he got. And so I took this back to, with, to San Francisco and thought about it, and uh, I came up with one other piece of the puzzle, just a, a, a missing piece as to why things behaved like they did, and, and wrote to David in the brand new internet then, and uh, boom, we had the makings of uh, what was going to be two papers that we published in 1990, and I, I believe those were David's first papers, so I had the, the privilege of collaborating uh, with David uh, I got there, I, I managed to get to him before anyone else did, I guess. Um, and um, and we, worked, we worked a lot by internet, actually, and it was, uh, we actually thanked, it was so new, this idea of communicating through the ether that uh, we, in the acknowledgement of the paper, we thanked what we called the ARPANET, internet, uh, ARPANET and SFNET for uh, allowing the collaboration to be possible. Uh, but we, we interacted quite a lot, and David also came up to San Francisco, and I remember, uh, him in the uh, kitchen of my apartment there. He was cooking something on the stove and I was telling him about some other things I had figured out about these models, about the roles of different kinds of constraints on the equations. And I remember David sitting there on, at the stove and instantly in his mind getting the geometric picture of what was going on in, in, a, in the space of the two first uh, eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the, uh, of the operator we were looking at. He instantly just got the geometry and boom, that was the makings of another paper that we published in 1994. Um, so we worked, we worked quite intensively on this, and then I came down to Caltech as a postdoc in 1990 and was there until 93, so we overlapped quite a lot. Um, we worked quite intensively on these papers, um, and, and we would be going for days, going through the math and the writing and so forth. And uh, my experience of it was essentially every day I would make a couple of errors, and David would correct me, and the next day I'd make a couple of errors, and David would correct me. And about once a year, perhaps, uh, David would make an error. Um, <laughs> and I'm not even sure of that event rate. It, it didn't have very many events to estimate it from. And if, it, it might have only been one in my memory. I don't know if there was actually more than one. But, um, and, and it actually occurs to me as I'm at the symposium that maybe it was the only such event anyone has ever observed. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, I remember when David did make a mistake, you would think, when he finally made a mistake, it would be on something very, very complicated and difficult. But in my memory, it was on something fairly simple, but somehow he just had his mind around the wrong way on it. And I have a memory, and memories may be distorted, but I have a memory of arguing with David for hours. And the issue is, you know, David is a very rational person, as we all know. He had a very strong, very well-founded prior 
that he didn't make mistakes. <laughs> and so it took literally hours to overcome this prior um, and convince him. And when finally I said whatever magic words finally got him out of a local minimum he was in, um, he was then so apologetic and so embarrassed. And I remember saying something like, uh, you know, David, you made your mistake for the year. You'll make another one next year. Don't worry about it. And <laughs> Um, it was quite remarkable to work with David. It was really stimulating. Um, and we were also very good friends during that time. Um, we hung out a lot at Caltech and, and uh, you know, as, as young people, I wasn't so young. I was about 15 years older than David because I'd spent a number of years out of school, but I guess I hadn't grown up, so I was young too. Um, but as young people do, we talked about everything, you know, uh, relationships and music and culture and politics and art, and it was just, a great time. Um, the other thing I want to say about David is that he was, um, he is a, a fanatic in, in the best sense of the word. Um, for David, there is, if something is true, that's the end of the story. It's the truth. There just isn't anything else. And uh, so if automobiles are bad for our environment, there's no reason why you can't just bicycle everywhere. And um, if open source software is good, there's no reason why you can't do everything with open source software. And most of us, including myself, are just not that dedicated to the truth. That we, our convenience and, and other issues become more important. Um, and I think it's that fanaticism that also led David to make the incredible contributions he's made to our understandings of energy and global warming. Uh, and it's also in his, uh, his blog that he's written now since he's been ill, you see the same spirit. It's not, this is the truth, let's just, there's nothing else, it's just the truth. You just deal with it, you just go on. It's been quite inspiring. So, um, I guess I've missed, uh, oh, I should say also David spent some time in, in San Francisco. I had one other chance to overlap with David. He spent six months in San Francisco when I was there as a faculty member. Um, he wasn't visiting me. Um, there, he was, I had a great chance to visit with him then, but he was, there was a, a woman involved. It was his motivation, not me. Um, uh, but I was very happy for that time as well. So I, I've since David went back to England after Caltech and except for that time in San Francisco, I, I've missed our friendship and the fact that we haven't been able to see very much of each other since then. But it was a wonderful time. And I just wish you as much wonderful time as you can have. Thanks. So I've brought a prop with me. Um, I've known David since he was in short trousers, but that doesn't convey much information because he still wears short trousers. <laughs> uh, but 24 years ago, I remember the conversation that I had with him. Um, I asked him to help me with uh, understanding and implementing neural networks. That was our very first conversation in Darwin College at lunch. And bear in mind uh, that I'm a physical metallurgist and a normal human being. And my knowledge of mathematics is very poor. So it was quite a challenge for us to communicate, but David was extremely patient. And the whole process was lubricated by the fact that we watched uh, endless Jackie Chan movies, uh, Mission Impossible, Star Wars. Uh, we, had, uh, we went on protest marches together. And of course, Darwin College. We saw each other frequently in Darwin College. So then uh, I began to get confidence in the method and we published 14 papers together. So if you look on Google Scholar, I'm ranked as his first co-author in the listing of authors. So these are really quite important papers from my point of view because uh, the method the Bayesian method and the neural network helped us to deal with extremely complex problems, which we can connect with our physical models as well. So as I gained confidence, um, I needed to prove to myself that uh, I understood the method. And the challenge came when a US immigration officer asked me why I wanted to enter the country. 
So I said to him, I'm going to give a talk on neural networks, and I thought I should explain a little bit more. Uh, okay. uh, so I said, you know, it works a little bit like the brain. So he said to me, I wish my boss had a neural network. <laughs> okay. But then, you know, um, this book appeared. And it really brought me down to earth again. Because look, uh, Robert, if you look at page one, unlike the brief history of time, there are 20 mathematical expressions on page one. So, you know, look how new this book looks, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I asked, I asked uh, David to sign this. And, uh, you know, he wrote something nice first, and then he said, enjoy the pictures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, I've had enormous fun, uh, fun with David, and there is another side to David, uh, which you've already seen from, uh, you know, he's touched a lot of human beings outside of the academic community. You saw Dasher, and I saw the origin of Dasher. So you got it wrong, you know, um, the train journey from Gatsby to Cambridge was the inspiration for Dasher, not for the book, uh, the second book. Uh, and uh, the enthusiasm with which he explained what he was doing, it was clear that this was going somewhere, you know. And the other occasion I remember where he made a big difference to somebody, to several people's lives, is he came in feeling very upset uh, at lunch in Darwin College because there had been a case where a woman had been accused of murdering her two babies who died in their sleep. And she lost the case. She was convicted of murder. Just imagine, you know, your two babies have died and then you're convicted of murder. And it was on the basis of uh, an abuse of statistics by an expert witness. So David immediately uh, joined with others to campaign for this, uh, including the family of the woman concerned. And eventually, the case was uh, dismissed uh, and declared a miscarriage of justice. But you can imagine the damage that was done. And, you know, she didn't last for long after getting released from prison. In, in the same uh, story, Several other women were released from prison because they had been uh, uh, misrepresented by this expert witness. Okay? So things like that, you know, he applied his knowledge and he was absolutely clear, as, as you said, on what is right and wrong about this stupid statistic which led to such profound implications. You know? So that isn't the only example I could talk, uh, talk at length, because I really have known him for about 24 years. But I want to criticize all of you, okay? Uh, the, the second book actually happened when um, there was a news story that if you unplug the charger, then you'll save the world, okay? And he started by... Um, creating an undergraduate course on the subject of sustainability, and that led to the book, which he published himself. But all of you have got the significance of this book completely wrong. Okay? Because had it not been for the book, he would not have gone to London. He would not have met Ramesh. Okay? The wonderful Ramesh who also enjoys uh, Jackie Chan movies and Mission Impossible <laughs> and Bond movies. And of course, after meeting Ramesh, there was some genetic mixing, and we have the wonderful uh, Torin and Ariska. So everything is connected, it's exactly what you said. So David, thank you very, very much for everything.
I came to Cambridge in uh, 1998 uh, to work in David's group, uh, first as a postdoc. And one, one aspect of David that struck me then and has struck me ever since is how he mixed knowledge and justice. And, or as uh, Victor Weisskopf, the uh, physicist said, human existence is based on two pillars, compassion and knowledge. Compassion without knowledge is ineffective. Knowledge without compassion is inhuman. And so I'd like to give a few examples of how David has contributed so much uh, to both those pillars of human existence. First, when I first came, what I first saw was the Sally Clark case, which uh, Harry just talked about. Uh, and if you look on the uh, sallyclark.org.uk website, you'll recognize the look and feel of the website as very similar to the inference group website. Uh, and you don't need to be a Bayesian to figure out why. Uh, so David was very active in trying to write an injustice uh, someone jailed, uh, as Harry said, through abuse of statistics. Then there was the Dasher Project. Again, joining knowledge of information theory, coding, uh, with compassion for others, for the handicapped, for helping people making, and making their lives better. Then what I also noticed was that David's book, uh, the information that, which was being written then, was already freely available. So students everywhere around the world had the benefit of the book, no matter what they could afford, uh, no matter whether they could even afford to go to university, it was available to the whole world. And that, of course, uh, already applied to Dasher, uh, which was open source, uh, freely licensed software. Again, the concern for students uh, with the freely available book on information theory extended more generally to a concern for teaching and for students right here. Uh, so David was known as one of the best teachers in the university, uh, and partly because of his dedication to the students. But not just students here, he contributed a great deal to the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cape Town, uh, teaching students from all across Africa. And then, as many Almost all of us know one of his largest projects, melding knowledge and compassion, working on climate change, uh, working against global warming, and helping the UK government and UK society understand the science better and plan for how to do that. Because of compassion for the generations that to be born, that they inherit a decent world as well. And I'll close on one uh, smaller personal note. Uh, when I was writing my book, which took only <coughs> 15, 17 years, uh, towards the end of that process, I sent David uh, my draft and asked if he had any comments. And this was just around the time he was returning from the government uh, to take up his post as Regis professor. And despite the harried times that that must have been, he came back with pages and pages of comments, improved, finding mistakes on and improving almost every single page, uh, for which I'm also very grateful. Again, for the, the melding of knowledge and concern for others. So many years ago, Feynman was giving a course on gravity at Caltech, and he talked about how it's it's really important, you know, in this course, we're going to try to keep our feet on the ground. Uh, you know, it's possible to have your head in the clouds, but we're going to keep our feet on the ground. He said, but, you know, on the other hand, Einstein, he had his feet on the ground and his head on the clouds, but Einstein was a very tall man. <laughs> uh, and in that same way, I'd like to acknowledge and honor someone who's contributed so much to these two pillars of human existence, knowledge and compassion, and made them that much taller so that they reached towards the clouds. Thank you, David.
also need a prop. So, although I'd known David a bit from uh, NIPS, I think the first time I really met him uh, properly was in uh, Toronto in Jeff Hinton's lab. So Jeff had lots of visitors um, around the time, so people to find out what the, why the last theory of the, how the brain works was wrong and how the next one was really, how the brain really worked. Or alternatively, how uh, applications of the, of the chain rule would be a, 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 could still be uh, used. Um, but it was when David came that there really was a sort of a palpable sense of excitement when, uh, when David would come to visit uh, Toronto. We knew we were really in for a treat. And even Radford Neal, who's known for his zen-like calm, those of you who know him, was a, you could see that he, even he was affected, uh, affected. And the best way to describe that treat really is energy without the hot air, I think. Uh, in a sense, the energy was extraordinarily exciting. So David was always fizzing with new ideas across a huge range of topics. And, the, and without any pretension and artifice, as, we, as we, I think we all know. And uh, um, you know, David, you've always got to the bottom, of, uh, um, the, the bottom and the heart of all matters with this sort of bewitching application of common sense and mathematical analysis that, that we can see in your, uh, your book, in fact, all your books. So you came back to the, so David came back to the UK before um, the Gatsby unit arrived, before we came back to the UK ourselves. And I think all four of the founders, so Zubin, uh, uh, Jeff and myself, obviously Zubin and I knew from Toronto and Sapling knew you actually before in John, John Hopfield's lab as a, as a student. So we're very inc incredibly enthusiastic you should come and visit us in, uh, in, 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 um, in, in London and to learn from you and also to build links to, to Cambridge. So we're very delighted then when you did indeed agree to come visit us and I know how much you dislike the uh, big smoke uh, as you would express very volubly many times um, but it was very kind of you to come and uh, visit us uh, so much and we actually had a nameplate made so we actually had a, one of our what was used to be a visitor office was then actually named of course after uh, named ma named uh, for you so you'd come and uh, 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 come and indeed you did come and so you come with wonderful ideas you know about uh, Dasher you talked about about uh, the work on muscles I think you did with your with your brother on digital fountain codes, I remember once you came back from San Francisco, with this very, uh, you know, very excited about that, or neural coding uh, on phases of activity uh, 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 in oscillations, um, or indeed the early days of thinking about energy. You also came and told us about that, and I think these are always the you were really the epit epitome of our tea talks. We have these like twenty-minute talks, and so David's are always the uh, some of the best ones we can have. So important, interesting, and fun. Um, uh, and you also encouraged some of your what turned out to be our best students, so Ian and, uh, Ian and Rich are actually here to come and come to. to Gatsby, for which was also extremely grateful. You're also wonderfully loyal, both to people, as we found out here, but also even to machines. I remember uh, those of you who know him from that period will know the, uh, the, uh, the, the Scion organizer, which uh, David had long before and long after it was fashionable. I think it's probably <laughs> fair to say. Um, so after you went to work for the government, we tragically saw a lot less of you. And that nameplate in the middle of the door, uh, that was the door you could come and visit, sort of migrated in my mind up to the top. So it became sort of the David Mackay room as opposed to David Mackay's room. Um, so our other visitors would be inspired and honored into, 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 when they were there into being essentially better than themselves, so inspired by, by that. that name, we actually moved last year, and that nameplate, which now no longer fits UCL's regulation, whatever it is, 743.11, is sadly lost. But I think we'll resurrect the idea and name one of our new visitor offices after you to carry on the tradition. So David, it's been an incredible privilege, uh, it, it is an incredible privilege to know you and to have learned from you. So energy without the hot air, long may it be sustainable. Thank you. Yep. All right, uh, thank you to all the speakers and lunch is served. Uh, see you back here at 2 p.m.